Welcome all to this uh, session of the Lugano Philosophy Colloquia. It's my pleasure to introduce Francesco Alessandro Sberto, the chair of the Logic and Metaphysics at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, also a member of the ILLC, this Logic and Language and Computation at the University of Amsterdam. Um, before joining uh, St. Andrews and uh, Amsterdam, he was indeed at Aberdeen, uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies, the University of Notre Dame, let me say, and the Ecole Normale Superior in Paris. And before them, he was also in Italy, in the University of Padua, and Venice, and Milan. Uh, Francesco's work on uh, many issues in logic, uh, philosophy of logic and metaphysics, uh, as well as philosophy of language and computation. Uh, some of his most recent works in the uh, book called the Topics of Thought, The Logic of Knowledge, Belief, and Imagination for Oxford University Press, and a book with the uh, co-author with Iago on uh, uh, Impossible Worlds, and uh, uh, something that is perhaps uh, more relevant, uh, or at least as relevant to his talk today. Uh, very recently, in 2023, he published a new paper called Logic Will Get You From A to B, and Imagination Will Take You Anywhere, so we expect him to lead us anywhere with the Im imaging and imagining. Thank you, Francesco. Thanks, thanks. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, so I should apologize twice. First, because I got this cold that has been killing me for days. So that's that's my voice. Um, everybody can hear me so down there, right? Okay, yeah. So forgive me if I sneeze or cough, something like shit. But that, that's that's just how it is. Sorry about that. Um, second, um, should apologize because um, so when I I was invited to give this talk, um, I thought I'd talk about stuff that I'm interested in and I'm working on right now, rather than old stuff. And what I mean to right now is formal epistemology in particular, involving probabilities, belief, belief revision, rationality of belief, and so on. Um, and then I thought, oh, but you know, there's some people in Lugano who are not super familiar with probabilities. And I thought about adding a few slides to this talk that have been presented around, which are the basics of probability theory. I didn't have the time, it's messy. Um, you know, some of you know, I'm head of department now, some tenders, which is the most horrible thing that can happen to an academy. It's been a bit spot. Okay, anyway, um, I hope everybody should be able to get the non, non techy part of the talk, and hopefully they will be interesting. Um, when I get to more techy stuff, I'll explain a few things, and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. So, um, I want to talk about imagination, but not any kind of imagination, the kind of imagination we engage in when we do suppositional thinking and we wonder, oh, what if blah, 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 okay? And we try to explore the consequences. We suppose something and we wonder what else is likely to be the case if the supposition is true. Or we suppose that something, what if something had been the case and we wonder what would have been likely if that had been the case, okay, suppositional. Thinking. So why it matters? Um, so first of all, I'm gonna focus on propositional imagination, so not objectual imagination. Okay, so you can imagine Paolo, okay? That's objectual imagination. Or you can imagine Donald Trump, that's objectual imagination. Propositional imagination is kind of mental state, which has propositional contents. So imagining that, and if he's in the kitchen, that Oswald has not killed Kennedy, or that Serena brings Wimbledon once again, okay? So it's a propositional attitude, like belief or knowledge, believing that, knowing that, or hope, hoping that, and so on. So that's a kind of uh, mental state that I'm uh, focusing on. Second, I'm gonna use to suppose and to imagine interchangeably and following a number of people. There's some people who want there to be a difference between supposing and imagining, okay? not just merely to be neurological. I think there are two distinct mental activities, particularly because some people want imagining to essentially involve pictorial mental imagery. Some people say that that's not necessary for imagining that P. I, I am uh, in agreement with these latter kind of people. 
beginning of some. So for me, to suppose that we imagine that we are going to use the session interchangeably. <clears throat> and next, I'm going to focus in so-called subjunctive or counterfactual supposition of imagination. So the kind of exercise we engage in when we ask ourselves questions like, what would be the case if something was the case? And that's very important. We do that all the time. For instance, when we want to investigate, we want to investigate the causes of events, we can wonder things like, oh, would we see such a particle crack if the atom was ionized? Okay? And you can, you can have uh, interest in the best explanation that works in this way. Or when we want to ascertain responsibilities, moral and legal, so would he have hit the brakes had he not been distracted when you know, that car accident happened? Or when we want to learn from past mistakes, I wonder, would they have won the match had they played with a different model? Okay? If they had played with a different model. That's a kind of counterfactual or hypothetical questions that we often engage by, that we often address by engaging in suppositional thinking of the kind that I'm investigating. Okay. Um, so we often answer by an imaginative or suppositional thinking. We imagine that something, A, obtains, and we wonder what would be likely under the supposition. Okay. And uh, that matters a lot also nowadays. Like people like Judea Pearl, who's a famous AI and computer scientist, is uh, uh, one of those who proposed the, one of the most influential theories of causation. He's been saying for years that no matter how good our deep neural network models are or large language models are, they only track probabilistic correlations. But he says, AI research will only move beyond stochastic machine learning when we come up with systems capable of tracking causal connections over and above probabilistic correlation, right? Because correlation is not causation, okay? Um, and such systems, says Perl, we have to imagine things being otherwise than they are in order to address the question of what would happen if we brought it about that A, if we made it so that A, as opposed to just observing that A. Okay, um, that's why this idea of counterfactual imagination is important. Um, but I want to address a puzzle that concerns counterfactual imagination. Um, it's been called, it has been called the puzzle of imaginative use by Amy Kine and Peter Kung, this lovely collection that we published a few years ago called Knowledge by Imagination. But the crucial topic of the collection is how can we gain knowledge by imagination? How is imagination epistemically useful? Since it's arbitrary departure from reality, how can it give us uh, reliably formed beliefs about reality, maybe knowledge about reality? Why is that a puzzle? Because, well, on the one hand, everybody agrees that we can form reliable judgments on issue that we explore in our imagination. But on the other hand, well, one may wonder how is the activity rational justified? In particular, because imagination has a reputation for being arbitrary departure from reality, arbitrary in ways belief is not. And everybody agrees on that. Okay? So imagination of supposition are arbitrary in ways in which belief is not arbitrary. You can imagine or suppose more or less whatever you like, but you can't believe whatever you like. So you can easily imagine that all of Lugano has been painted pink. That's easy to do. But it's not that you can make yourself believe that Lugano, all of it has been so painted, right? Because you, you have overwhelming evidence of the contrary. So belief is not subject to voluntary control in, in a way imagination or supposition is. Okay? So given that you can suppose whatever you like, how comes that on the other hand, it seems to be when properly used, a reliable mechanism to gain new uh, good beliefs and maybe knowledge. That's the puzzle of imagining. Okay, so um, I, I phrased the questions that I gave you before as examples as um, from the fact of hypothetical question. So I used if, what if, blah, blah, blah. And the if, of course, leads to conditions. We often assess conditionals by imagining a situation in which the antecedent is true and estimating the chances of the consequent in the imagined scenario. 
So when you want to assess a conditional, if A, then B, that's the indicative, but we're going to focus on the kind of fact one. Um, if A, then B, and you are uncertain on whether A, I mean, if you know that A is true, you don't need to test the condition, you just go and test the concept, right? If you're unsure about the antecedent, you say, well, suppose that the antecedent is true, then what? Okay. How likely is the consequent supposing the antecedent? Um, and so we often distinguish imagination in the indicative and counterfactual mode by mapping them to the distinction between the two kinds of conditionals. Conditionals in the indicative mode, so on the form if A and B, conditionals in the subjunctive or counterfactual mode. So if it were the case that A, then it would be the case that B, or if it had been the case that A, then it would have been the case that B. Um, and that's the usual example. You find it at the beginning of David Lewis's kind of factuals. He gives the example back to Adams, Sanog, Chestnut. Okay. So that's the two famous Oswald conditionals. Okay. Now to begin with, let's say that we are all uh, we all take seriously the results of the Warren Commission. So we more or less believe that Oswald acted alone. Okay, you may not believe that, you may think it's all a conspiracy, but let's pretend that, that the Warren Commission was right. So he acted alone. Okay, good. Now, these are two conditionals. In both cases, the antecedent is about Oswald not killing Kennedy. And in both cases, the consequence is about somebody else killing Kennedy, but the mood is different. One is the indicative mode. If Oswald did not kill Kennedy, as someone else did, the other one is, is in the counterfactual mood. If Oswald had not killed Kennedy, then someone else would have. Okay. And we are inclined to assign different truth values to the two conditionals, right? So in both cases, we imagine or suppose that Oswald has not killed Kennedy, because that's the antecedent. But our conclusions are different, because we take one as true and two as false, right? Because when you assess one, well, suppose Oswald did not kill Kennedy. OK, well, um, Kennedy has been killed, right? Good. So it must have been somebody else. So if Oswald did not kill Kennedy, then someone else did. But things work differently with you. Mm -hmm. Suppose Oswald had not killed Kennedy. What is the difference? Suppose Oswald, Oswald had not killed Kennedy. OK? What you do here is something different. You kind of imagine a counterfactual alternative course of events. So you imagine something like, well, maybe a bit before that day, Oswald changes his mind. Maybe he goes there and he shoots, but he misses Kennedy. And then Kennedy ducks down and the car starts running fast and the policeman starts looking and done. Okay, he failed. And in such a situation, again, Warren Commission, you have to be alone. You may say, well, if Oswald had missed uh, in that way, well, maybe Kennedy would have gone on to live his life peacefully and he would have died an old man. That's not unlikely in this counterfactual scenario. And that's why we take the counterfactual to false. Okay? But in both cases, we imagine the same antecedent that Oswald tells to kill Kennedy. So the two kinds of imaginings differ. How do they differ? So there's a mainstream answer to this that says, we only suppose in the indicative mood when A has some chance of truth for us. Okay? So when the probability that we assign to A being true is not zero, okay? when we are not certain that A is false. Now I'm talking about probabilities, but the kind of probability that I have in mind are subjective probabilities, okay? degrees of belief or degrees of confidence. Okay, so you may be fully confident that two plus two plus four, that means your subjective probability of that claim is one. Okay? You may be moderately confident that, I don't know, Inter will win the next Italian football championship. So your subjective probability for the claim Inter will win the next football championship is something like a 0 0.63. You may have no opinion whatsoever on whether tomorrow it will rain in Lugano. So with the sentence tomorrow, if you rain in Lugano, you assign probability 0.5, and okay? you're completely undecided. So that's the kind of probability that we talked about in this, uh, this talk. Okay. Um, so for instance, Bennett, in his classic book on conditionals, says, 
You cannot say what the upshot is of adding to your belief system something you actually regard as having no chance of being true. There is abundant intuitive evidence that nobody has any use for if A then C, that is symbolism for the indicative conditional, when for him the probability of A equals zero. Okay. <laughs> Whereas that's not so for counterfactual supposition. You may suppose counterfactually that A, even when you're sure that A is false. And that links to what has been called the Ramsey test. There's a little footnote in Ramsey's paper, General Propositions and Causality, which is kind of a legendary footnote, okay? And in which Ramsey comes up with what has been called the Ramsey test for how we assess indicative conditionals. And the idea is, well, we assess if A then B by hypothetically adding A to our belief system. Okay. Suppose A what is still adjusting for consistency in the light of the addition. So we bias the rest of your beliefs as little as possible to accommodate the supposition and check the result in status of B. And that's why traditionally one links the probability of a conditional to the conditional probability. So the probability of if A then B is linked, and that's just a notation for conditional probability. Right? So it's the probability of B given A or the probability of B conditional on A. Um, can the identity can be that the probability of if A then B indicative is the probability of B conditional on A, because Lewis in 1976, he was a genius, he came up with this little paper called Probabilities of Conditionals and Conditional Probabilities, in which he showed that if you assume its identity, you get the infamous triviality results. So the only probability function that can satisfy the identity are trivial probability functions. So basically, you reduce the probability of an indicative to the probability of the consequent for any indicative. Which is crazy. Okay. There's a lot of literature on these ideality results on conditionals. Um, good. Uh, we don't need to get into this because that's not very important. But it doesn't matter because, for instance, psychologists are just fine with a robust correlation, and that's experimentally tested. There's a lot of experimental results which show that people tend to find an indicative conditional likely to the extent that they find uh, the consequent likely conditional on the other side. Right? So people find if A then B likely to the extent that they find uh, uh, B likely conditional on A given. Okay. Besides, normally you define conditional probabilities in terms of unconditional ones. It's called the ratio formula. So the probability of B given A just is the ratio between the probability of A and B and the probability of A. And when you do that, well, of course, that's going to be undefined when the probability of A is zero, right? So the fraction is not undefined anymore. And that gives mathematical substance to what Bennett has said. When P of A is zero, eh, all bets are off. Okay, I think that's all wrong. Okay, so the main thing is wrong. <laughs> For instance, that's not my example, it's Tim Williamson's example. Um, here's something I'm totally certain of that I exist now, I refers to me and now it's the current one. So that's Cartesian certainty, okay? So I, if, there's, if there's a claim to which I give probability one, is I exist now while I'm uttering it. But, says Williamson, surely I can imagine that I don't exist and reasonably assess the indicative, if I do not exist now, then thinking occurs without a thinker, okay? And that's a bit of an exotic example. Only a philosopher could come up with it. In fact, it happens all the time. For instance, in mathematical reasoning, because we make uh, suppositions in the indicative mood, or we assert indicative conditionals by way of reduction in lots of mathematical proofs. So, for instance, I don't know, uh, while proving the infinity of primes, that there are infinity many prime numbers, the teacher claims, uh, you, see, you prove by reduction. Okay, so suppose there's a larger prime that contradicts it. Um, if there's a largest prime, then some number is both prime and composite. That's an indicative, and it's clear to everybody that the teacher is carrying out the proof by reduction. So the teacher gives zero probability to the antecedent. There is no largest prime. And even we, who, who learn the proof from the teacher, we also believe that because, yeah, we know what's going on, right? 
Um, one may say, well, but maybe they are covered counterfactuals. So maybe that really means if there had been a largest plant, then some number would have been what by a company. But I mean, if somebody goes for that, if you choose the last household, because I mean, on the face of it, these are all indicatives, and it may seem ad hoc to postulate the distinction between grammatical appearance and reality just to save the view. So I think that unpretentious thinkers can imagine in the indicative mode that A, suppose that A, and consider what is likely then also when they assign zero chance to A. One can non trivially assess conditional like one, the Oswald conditional, if Oswald didn't kill Kennedy, then someone else did. Also, when, he's, when one is absolutely certain that Oswald did kill Kennedy. That has been claimed by few people, but one of them is Jim Joyce in his book that I like a lot, Foundations of Causal Decision Theory. And Joyce at some point says, it's often assumed that any form of probabilistic belief in a vision, which involves raising the dead by increasing the probabilities of certain false propositions, must involve counterfactual beliefs. This is not so. It is logically consistent both to be certain that some proposition is false and yet to speculate about what the world is like if one is in fact wrong. To be subjectively certain of something is, after all, not the same as regarding oneself infallible on the matter. So I think he's right. And that's also a techy fix for the thing. So I'll be very quick. You can avoid that <laughs> the fact that the probability of A is zero makes the corresponding condition probability uh, undefined radically. There are alternative approaches to probability theory in which one takes uh, conditional probabilities as primitives. One doesn't define them as ratios of unconditional ones. So there are the so called proper functions or proper any functions properly like that back in the 50s and so stuff. So you can easily provide the technical fix. I don't care about that. Uh, what I care about is this, is if we should not draw the line between indicative and counterfactual imagination in the mainstream way, how should we draw the line? <laughs> now I'm going to tell you about Cotenables, and I'm going to speak to you about Lewis at length. So having started by imagining that A in an exercise of counterfactual suppositions, don't just stick with the initial supposition. We import background beliefs, background knowledge that we have, of the kind that he is called contenable. He was born into the knowledge from Goodman. That's that's the counterfactuals in the book. Um, for instance, when one supposes that one jumps over a stream, wonder whether one would make it to the other side if one tried. Again, this one example, one imports one's background beliefs of one's actual physical abilities. One's estimate of the actual width of the stream, width, 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 um, and so on, right? That's what you do. So you're wondering whether it's okay to try and jump the stream. But you're not sure. You may not make it and hurt yourself. So what do you do? You imagine trying. So what if I try to jump this stream? And then you bring in all the background knowledge and belief that you have concerning physical abilities, make an estimate of the width of the stream, and you try to guess whether in case you jumped, you would make it, right? Because you're trying to settle the issue. Uh, you don't want to blindly try. Um, you want to minimize the risk of hurting yourself. <clears throat> so you keep the imagination realistic in this case, right? So this is called reality orientation or reality monitoring in cognitive psychology. So in suppositional thinking, we keep, see, the situation that we imagine must be as similar as it gets in the actual world, compatibly with the need to accommodate the initial supposition. Now, of course, if you like, you can imagine that you jump and that wings go on your back and then you magically fly to the other side of the stream. Because you can imagine whatever you like. If you like, you can imagine that. But that would be a very stupid thing to do, right? Because your, your task is to try to guess whether you would make it if you jump, given your actual physical Possibly, right? So it's in your interest to keep the imagination realistic. Good. And so there's some consensus in the philosophy of suppositional thinking on the fact that imagination of this kind can be epistemically valuable, can be a good source of new, well earned, well grounded beliefs, insofar as it is in some sense regimented. Okay. Uh, 
And so it depends from how we know or believe reality to be just as much as needed for the supposition. <laughs> but then, and that's the thought that I had, imaginative thinking must work as a kind of simulated belief revision, constrained like its real counterpart by a principle of minimal change. There's a lot of work done in formal theories of belief revision, in epistemic logic, probability theory, and so on. And, but all of these differences, like AGM, theories of belief revision, dynamic epistemic logic, whatever, uh, all of these approaches stick to this rough idea that when we revise our beliefs in the light of new information, we revise them as little as possible compatibly with the need to accommodate the new information. Okay? Um, so here's a case of real belief revision. Um, you thought that Arif was uh, in the living room. But then it's known and you see that Arif has moved to the kitchen and you revise your beliefs. You revise them minimally, minimally compatibly with the news, with the new information you just got. You drop the belief that Arif is in the living room and the thought that Arif is cooking maybe becomes likely enough for you to believe it. Oh, well, it's in the kitchen. It's probably enough that he's going to be there because he's cooking. So I'm going to believe that he's cooking. Um, but you retain a number of previously held beliefs. You don't touch them. Like that there's an oven in the kitchen that Arif can use to cook it and so on. Okay. Now, supposition must work the same way, except that you don't really get the news perceptually online, um, for instance, by seeing that Arif is in the kitchen. You just simulate getting, getting the news offline, in offline mode, and you check what's likely in the imagined scenario. But otherwise, the situation is similar enough. Okay? So supposing that Arif is in the kitchen and minimally revising your beliefs accordingly under the supposition, is very similar to learning that Arif is in the kitchen and minimally revising your beliefs accordingly. Good. Um, so I claim that the difference between indicative and kind of factor imagination lies in which beliefs are containable in the two modes. Go back to the two Oswald conditionals. So the indicative, if Oswald didn't kill Kennedy, then someone else did. If Oswald had not killed Kennedy, then someone else would have. So when we imagine in the indicative mode that Oswald has not killed Kennedy, Surely we retain as containable our belief that Kennedy was killed. And so it must have been somebody else. And that's why we take the indicative Oswald conditional as true. So suppose Oswald does not kill Kennedy. OK, we stick to the belief that we have that Kennedy has been killed. That, that's what has really happened. So of course, it must have been somebody else. But when we imagine that factually, we depart from how we know or believe a quality to be like, so that we can make relevant comparisons with it from within the supposition. So we relinquish that belief in the counterfactual scenario and find it plausible that nobody else kills Kennedy there. That's why we take the counterfactual Oswald conditional as false. Okay. But how exactly do we minimally alter the probabilities that we assign to various claims in counterfactual imagination? So we may take indicative imagination in Bayesian spirit as simulated belief revision governed by conditionalization. That's kind of the standard way of representing belief revision probabilistically. Okay? So the idea is um, you got a bunch of claims and you assign to them different degrees of belief. You're fully confident of some things, like two plus two is four. You're moderately confident of some other claims, like the Inter championship. You have you have no opinion on yet other claims, like tomorrow to win Lugano and so on. So you have a distribution of probabilities. You assign different probabilities to lots of claims, and those are supposed to represent uh, your degree of belief or degree of confidence. Those kind of things. Your degree of confidence. Yeah. True. And Bayesian say, well, when you get new information, you revise by conditionalizing. So when you learn that A, you conditionalize all of your past beliefs to A. And so that your new probability for each one of these claims is the probability of the claim conditional on the new thing that you just learned. Um, 
But indicative as can the factor imagination between containability, I argue. So what is the latter governed by? This is it not standard Bayesian conditionalization. So Lewis, so the genius in the same paper in which he came up with the triviality results concerning the probabilities of indicative uh, of condition, indicative conditions and condition probabilities, he came up with an, you know, an alternative method to revise probabilities. It's been called imaging. That's nice. It was just sitting there waiting for somebody to use it to model counterfactual imagination, imagining by an image. Um, so following Joyce, I'm going to say that it plays for counterfactual imagination, the role that conditionalization plays for imagination in the indicative mode. OK, so here's how imaging works. And that's where things get um, get a bit tacky. So um, it's done with possible worlds. Okay. Um, so take a finite set of possible worlds, W. It's finitely many worlds in there. Okay? Not infinitely many. Everything works in possible worlds. Okay? Teaching is something like that thing. So possible words are used also to do probabilistic belief revision. Um, take a finite set of possible words. The total closeness of similarity ordering. Okay? That's another idea that has been around for a while. So the idea is that some possible worlds are more similar than some other possible worlds to some other possible worlds, okay? So here's the actual world. Take a possible world which is exactly like the actual world, except that I'm one inch taller. That's very similar to the actual world, right? I'll take another possible world in which, I don't know, the laws of physics and biology are turned upside down so, you, so that you can be entirely simultaneously in two different places or whatever. I'll take a world in which the course of history is completely different. Okay. Um, those seem to be very remote. Or remoteness means dissimilarity. They seem to be way less similar to the actual world than the world which is exactly like the actual world, except that I'm one inch. So there's this intuitive idea that's been out for a while. It has been used in the semantics traditionals by Stan Laker and Lewis that you can order possible worlds by similarity. The closeness order is an order of Okay, so you can have different kinds of imaging that come out from different transfer functions, but transfer functions are just functions which specify how probabilities are moved around under a counterfactual supposition. So this is the general shape of a, of a transfer function. Transfer function takes as input the supposition, let's say A, and two possible worlds, W and W1, and spits out the proportion of the probability assigned to a world W by a probability distribution P, which is to be moved to world W1 when we can't factually imagine A. So you must think that we assign probabilities to worlds. Okay, it's easy enough. Your probability for a certain world is how likely you take that world as a candidate for actuality. But the important constraint is that the probabilities must add up to one, of course. Okay. So you assign probabilities to the various possible worlds. This is very likely, this is less likely, this is equally really unlikely, but all of them must add up to one. Okay. Now the probability of world W1 under the supposition of A according to tensor function T, that's just dissertation, probability of W1 under the counterfactual supposition of A according to the tensor function T. In general, it's just defined this way. So for each world, you take the proportion of its probability just to be transferred to world W1 according to the transfer function. So you transfer from W to W1, and you add all of them together. And then, this is standard, you define the probability of B, or B is a sentence, under the image of A as the sum of the probabilities of the worlds where B is true. That's, that's totally normal. Okay. So you can take sentences as expressing propositions, and you can take the standard way propositions as sets of possible words. Okay? It's just the standard way. Um, so the probability of a sentence is the probability of the proposition expressed by a sentence. And that's just the sum of the probabilities of the words in that set. Okay, Simple. OK. Next, assume following Stanlaker, as Lewis himself did in the original paper, 
that for each world W and formula A, which can make for a possible antecedent, there is a single closest A world. So we can call it W A or W sub A. So for any world W and A, there is a single world which is the closest or most similar world to W where A is true. That's how the Stalakirian counterfactual effect works. Some of you may be familiar with that. Okay, we're gonna relax this assumption later on, but that's how Lewis sets things up in the original paper. So you may know that Lewis himself criticizing this assumption because he shoots against Stalnaker in counterfactuals. Okay, but he used this assumption that to each world there is a closest A world um, in the 1976. Okay, so that's the standard key that transfer function. Basically, a transfer function that uh, transfers the probability of each world to its closest A world. Okay. Of course, this may already be a world that makes A true, and then it is its own closest world. Okay. So if you already make A true, then you are the closest world to yourself. And then probabilities are not the process. You just rethink whatever probability you have. Otherwise, if you have one of the worlds that doesn't make any true, all of your probabilities given to the closest world to you that makes any true. Okay? So that's the standard Kirian transfer function that reassigns probabilities. Yes, um, so probabilities are only moved around, not created or destroyed. So one can easily show that um, the probability condition of, on the image on the standard Kirian function is a probability distribution when P is. So when you do standard key and imaging on a probability distribution, you still get a probability distribution. So if the original thing satisfies the model of access of probability, so does the new probability distribution. It is a probability distribution. Okay. Now Lewis says in the paper that both the standard conditionalization and imaging are minimal forms of revision, but they are minimal in different ways. So says Lewis, imaging P on A gives a minimal revision in this sense. Unlike all other revisions of P to make A certain, so which makes A uh, get probability one, it involves no gratuitous movement of probability from worlds to dissimilar worlds. Conditionalizing P on A gives a minimal revision in this different sense. And like all other revisions of P to make A certain, it doesn't distort the profile of probability ratios equalities and inequalities among sentences that imply A. And it gives a simple little example that explains the difference. So I'm just gonna reproduce this example. So take three equally probable worlds. So let's take a little, little model that only has three possible worlds, okay? Um, oops, I picture them. Oh, this is W, um, this is W1, and here's world W2. Okay. Um, and they all have the same probability. The probabilities must, must add up to one, so they get one third of one. One third. Okay. Um, next, suppose that sentence A is true at W1 and it's true at W2, but it's not true at W. So A is through here, and A is through here, but it's not the case that A is through here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and that, that's also the similarity ordering, so the closeness ordering. So W1 is more similar to W than W2. W1 is closer, W2 is more remote. That's a, that's a simple thing. Now, when you conditionalize standard Bayesian manner, what do you do? Well, when you conditionalize an A, well, you kick out all the worlds where A is not true, okay? So you kick out this one. This one goes away because it doesn't make, doesn't make A true and you're left with the other two. But then you renormalize because the probabilities need to keep adding up to one, okay? And you renormalize by distributing the probabilities uniformly. So, so say that this is conditionalization 
and this is imaging. When you do conditionalization, the probabilities are gonna be one half and one half. Okay. Those are your probabilities for the remaining words. But imaging is different because you use the similarity orbital in between worlds that you don't use in normal conditionalization. So in imaging on A, we still kick out W because it doesn't make the way. So far, imaging works like conditionalization, but we also explore it closest. So we give a bonus to this guy because that's the closest of preferred words. So we distribute when we image on A probabilities differently. So now this one, gets to third, and this one stays at one third. So the probability still add up to one, but this one gets a bonus, okay? So with the redistribution of probabilities different should be conditional okay? That's a simple example that shows the difference between the two ways of the probability. That's why it really says, oh, in one case, uh, conditionalization, you don't distort the profile of probability ratios, okay? Because these were one third, one third, this one one half and one half. The ratio is still the same between the survivors. Okay? That's not so with imaging because it gives a bonus to the closest one. Good. That clarifies the difference in containable beliefs, which beliefs are containable when we suppose counterfactually as, as opposed to supposing indicatively. Um, in fact, there's a little result by Gardner Force we have shown that conditionalization is conservative. What that means translated into imagination is this. When one imagines indicatively that A, wondering how likely B is then, and one is certain of a certain C, or a containable C, so a size to what we want to see, then also the probability of C conditional on A is going to be one. So if you're sure of C, you will be sure of C after conditionalization. Okay? That's why when you wonder what is the case if Oswald did not kill Kennedy and you are certain that Kennedy has been killed, you stick to that certainty. Keep assigning probability one to that. Okay? And that's why the indicative Oswald condition sounds true. But imaging is not conservative. You may have been certain of something before imaging, and that may become uncertain for you when you imagine counterfactual today. So when one wonders what would have been the case if Oswald had not killed Kennedy, one may relinquish one's belief that Kennedy was killed, even though you're, you're certain of that uh, otherwise, um, which explains why the counterfactual Oswald conditional sounds false. Good. And now the final step, which is the crucial bit of the stock. If you buy all of this, so the counterfactual imagination is governed by that probabilistic minimal revision procedure, which Lewis picked up and which is called imaging, special kind of imaging, where I have to complicate things a bit more. But anyway, um, you have an argument to show that it's a rational procedure. If you buy a few more assumptions on what counts as rational for uh, what counts as rationality for a belief system. So under certain assumptions, there are certain accuracy-based strategies in epistemology, and it can in fact be vindicated the rationality of counterfactual. So you may have heard about this thing called accuracy first epistemology. It's just a motto because, you know, there's another motto which is very famous in epistemology and which involves using first. Oh. Knowledge first, yeah, right, okay. That's the motto by Tim Williamson, okay? Knowledge first, okay. So knowledge is a primitive notion. Stop trying to analyze and define your knowledge as Justify through belief or something else, blah, blah, blah. Knowledge is a primitive concept. You use it to explain that something. That's knowledge first. Accuracy first, that's a different thing. These are people who focus on beliefs, um, which are petty beliefs, for instance. And these are people who claim that the fundamental epistemic virtue of our degrees of belief or credences is how accurate they are. And accurate just, seem, just means close to the truth, okay? So the fundamental epistemic and rational virtue of a system of beliefs is how close your beliefs are to the truth, to the way things really are. And there's a way to measure that. <laughs> okay, so 
Now I have to complicate the technicalities. Uh, and then I will explain the measure. Um, okay, let's go. Um, so you need to generalize imaging. First, we need to reject the singlest closest world assumption. So we reject the assumption that for each supposition A and possible world W, there is one single closest A world, one single, one single closest world where A is two. <coughs> we do that by using set selection functions. So these are functions which output for each world W and an antecedent of supposition A, the set of maximally closed A worlds among which the probabilities are gonna be distributed. So that's a function that takes us into your supposition A and the world and spits out the set of closest or most similar to W worlds where A is two. There may be many of them, okay? Um, so generalized transfer function, let's call it G, only asks that all probabilities be moved only to the worlds in there, the closest A worlds. And that these are that to one first. Um, so if that one is not one of the closest A words, then it's get zero. Otherwise, the transfer from W to W1 amounts to one when you add up, you do the sum summation all the words for all the words W1, which are the closest A words. Um, now there's a specific form of generalized imaging, one in which you take. This is just um, the set of worlds where A is true, the truth set of A. Um, just assume that the set of closest A worlds um, coincide with that. That has been called Laplacian by Joyce. I don't know why, I think because Laplace had some principle of indifference or something like that. And if you know your Laplace better than me, which is very likely to be the case, I mean, guess why it's been called this way. Anyway, the principle is that the redistribution of probabilities should be uniform among the closest or most similar A worlds. Now, double notation, suppose that this is the cardinality effect. So this is a set of words, a set of words of which A is true. This is the cardinality of that set. So it's the number of those words. It's the number of words of which A is true. And the Laplacian works like that. I'm not even going to read it to you. The important clause is only the, the third one, this one. It says, when you move probabilities by Laplacian tensor function, and the supposition A for world WN, world WN, what happens in this case, which is the relevant one, is if WN is not one of the worlds where A is true, but WN is one of the worlds where A is true, then you just switch all the probability and you split it uniformly by the number of A worlds. Okay? So you just give it all to the A worlds and you split it in a uniform way. Now, there's a crucial result proved by Hans Leitgeb and Pettigrew, which shows the following. That's a mouthful. I will explain to you what that means. Uh, Laplacian imaging, so imaging done with that transfer function, minimizes expected inaccuracy from all probability functions that assign probability 1a as measured by the prior score. So now I'm going to explain to you a couple more things. First of all, what is the prior score? So prior. This was a guy who was a meteorologist. Okay. So he invented a way to measure the accuracy of meteorological predictions. So how cold, how close up a meteorological prediction is to how the weather really is going to be. And the bias score is just a score of accuracy. It has been used to measure how close a probability distribution is to the truth. It's also called the mean square error uh, measure. It measures the inaccuracy, so distance from the truth of a probability distribution as distance from the ideal probability distribution. So what is the ideal probability distribution? It's the distribution that assigns probability one to all and only the truths and zero to all and only the falsehoods. You can think of like the opinions of an omniscient agent, like God, right? So God knows everything. Okay. So if something is true, God knows. And so God is fully confident that it is true. Besides probability one to that. If something is false, God knows. Okay. And so God is fully confident that that thing is false. Okay. So it's a God-like, fully maximally opinionated 
probability distribution. And so you can measure how accurate a certain probability distribution is by measuring the distance with respect to the idea of the godlike probability distribution. Basically, it measures the distance as the crow flies. Um, it's possibly the most popular Bayesian inaccuracy measure, and Richard has argued that it's the only scoring rule that displays the number of features that a good measure of expected inaccuracy should have. Um, I'll give you a simple example of how the bias score rule works. Um, suppose that we're working only with two sentences. Um, A and B. So I'd say that A is um, I know Inter Inter will win the championship. That's Inter Inter play. And B is the uh, the reigning Lugano play. Lugano. So A is Inter will win the championship, and B is it will rain tomorrow in Lugano. Okay. So they can be both false. Let's say zero is for false and one for true. Or it can be that A is true, B is false. Or it can be that A is false, and B is true. Or it can be that they're both true. Okay. Inter wins the championship against the Milan. Okay. Those are just the four possibilities. Okay. Does somebody support Inter? <laughs> yeah, good. So, so let's say that it's true that it is the championship. Good. And also the other one is true. It's true that it's, it's gonna rain tomorrow in the gun. Okay. So that's what God is. God knows, right? So he assigns probability one to A and probability one to B. That's the ideal probability distribution stated here. But you're not not so confident, you have no opinion on whether it will rain tomorrow in the gun. So you have, you have a zero five. You're moderately confident that Inter will win tomorrow, it's like a zero seven or something like that. So, yeah, yeah. so if you can join, that's where you are. Okay. Now that's what the bias score measures. It measures the difference between your probability distribution and the ideal one. Okay. So that's the that's a number that measures that, which is given by the bias score. It's just a mathematical rule that I understand. Um, suppose. Sorry about that. It's different than Inter will not win. Okay. It's also not gonna rain in Lugano. So God is here. Okay. And you're still here because you're still moderately confident that Inter will win. So this is your distance. Okay. This distance is bigger. Okay. So in this situation, your beliefs are less accurate. They're more distant from the truth as represented by the Whereas in this case, where Inter wins and it's raining in the tomorrow, then your beliefs are more accurate. Okay. So you see what accuracy is. It's just closeness to the truth. Okay. So it's, that's what the price is, it's just a mathematical formula. You know? Okay, good. And now by all of this package, we get an argument for the rationality counterfactual imagination via a passion image. Suppose the bias score is a of the good measure of the inaccuracy of our degrees of belief. Suppose that accuracy or closeness to the truth is a of the key epistemic closure of our belief systems. That can be disputed. It's something to think one. Accuracy is not the fundamental virtue of our beliefs. Maybe other things are more important. What's more important is that I don't know, your beliefs lead you to success in life. I don't know. You may even have massively inaccurate beliefs still. Get it done, okay. And you make money, I don't know, and you're happy. That's good. Okay, but suppose instead that accuracy is what matters. Okay? The fundamental rational virtue of your belief system is that it's as close to the truth as it gets, as accurate as it gets. Good. Um then Laplacian counterfactual imagination maximizes such a virtue because it minimizes the expected inaccuracy. And that's just a mathematical result. And so we have a vindication of counterfactual imagination insofar as it's governed by imaging of this kind. Counterfactual imagination is epistemically irrational insofar as it's a maximally, expectedly, 
accurate way to hypothetically update your belief system in the light of counterfactual suppositions. Okay, I'm gonna skip the rest. I've talked enough, and I'm gonna thank you and take questions.